Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm thankful to be gathered with you all. And, uh, yeah, thankful, thankful for this opportunity. Um, why don't we, um, why don't we stand and pray and, uh, yeah, let's start by prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be together, to uh, be in each other's presence, and we ask you to be with us, to speak to us, to minister to our hearts, and um, we just know that you're the, the giver of all good things. And so we ask you to be here and watch over us. And I pray for your help with uh, sharing these thoughts um, that are in my head. And um, pray that you would help me with that. We thank you, Lord, for the rain that you've been giving us the last few days. Um, thank you for all the good things you give us. Be with the brothers and sisters who are out and about traveling or, or elsewhere today, minister to them and, and keep them in your care and be with uh, brothers and sisters who uh, are just facing trials and think, think especially, Lord, of our brother John Stadola and his family, just be with them in a special way. and. Keep them in your care. Be with the work in Honduras. Bless it. And, and uh, be with the brothers and sisters there and the brothers and sisters in New York and, and everywhere, Lord. I pray that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I pray for your blessing on the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, um, I had an inspiration earlier this week, <clears throat> and, uh, and then when I started thinking more about it, I just feel like it just kept getting bigger, and, and, and now I'm going to try to share some of these thoughts, but I, uh, I just hope the Lord can... Uh, help me with just the the scatteredness of my mind about <coughs> um, about all these thoughts that I've had that kind of pertain to this. Let let me start by reading Isaiah chapter fifty five. It's, it's kind of a scripture to open open with. <coughs> Isaiah 55, you who are thirsty, go to the water, and all you who have no money, go and buy wine and fat and eat and drink without money and price. Why do you value the price of money and give your toil for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat good things, and your soul will delight in good things. Incline your ears and follow my ways. Listen to me and your soul shall live in good things. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the holy and faithful thing of David. Behold, I made him a witness among the Gentiles, a ruler and a commander of the Gentiles. The Gentiles which did not know you shall call upon you, and the people who did not understand you shall take refuge in you because of your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he, is, for he glorified you. Seek God, and when you find him, call upon him, and when he draws near near. Call upon him when he draws near to you. Let the ungodly man abandon his ways and the lawless man his counsels and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. He shall forgive your sins abundantly for my counsels are not your counsels, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. 
But as heaven is distant from earth, so is my ways from your ways and your thoughts from my thoughts. For as rain comes down or snow from heaven and does not return until it saturates the earth and brings forth and produces and gives seed to the sower and bread for food, so shall my word be whatever produces from my mouth. It shall not return until it accomplishes whatever I willed and I will prosper your ways and my commandments. For you shall go forth with gladness and shall be taught with joy for the mountains and hills shall exult to receive you with joy and all the trees of the field shall applaud with their branches instead of the broom tree shall be the, come up the cypress and instead of nettles shall come up the myrtle and the Lord shall be for a name and for an everlasting sign and he shall not fail. I like this psalm. There's quite a few verses in there that are pretty, pretty well known by a lot of people, but Isaiah starts with, sorry, did I call it a psalm? Um, it's a prophecy, I guess, and a, it could be called a piece of poetry, but um, Isaiah starts with inviting us to partake in something, something real, something satisfying, something more, um, something more substantial than bread, that we eat and we're nourished for a little bit, but then uh, we get hungry again and uh, we need another piece of bread. Um, something, something more than that. And it's something that money can't buy. Instead, we can have it by, as it says in here, by inclining our ear, by listening diligently, by following his way, by seeking God, by calling upon him, and by abandoning ungodly ways and thoughts and returning to God. And his promise in here is that he'll make a covenant with those people. Even with the Gentiles, they will come in and they'll seek refuge, it says, in, in this, what he calls in, in, this, in this writing, the holy, uh, the holy one of David, the holy thing of David. Um, then there in verse 10 and 11, he promises how his, his word will bring forth. It will accomplish what it was sent out for. And then he ends it with likening us as a tree but no longer just a broom tree, no longer just nettles, but something beautiful, something useful. It will not be the broom tree, which is, as I understand, more or less a bush in the desert, but it'll be a cypress tree. Uh, it'll be something, something beautiful, something more glorious, something uh, um, uh, that bears something better. And instead of the nestles, uh, nettles, it'll be um, the myrtle tree. Trees are a major theme in the scripture. They're a major part. Um, just all through the scriptures, they're a major part in the beginning. Um, trees were there. In, in, in the scripture, trees were part of what man partook of that brought death upon him. Um, they're also, metaphorically, they're a major part of our salvation that we would, that we would take from the tree of life. Um, and in this last week, I had this inspiration about a tree. And, um, and I'm going to I'm try to portray this to you. It, it, it kind of came from trying to, I don't know where all it came from. But, but one, one thing is, I, I often try to like think about how God sees things. Um, because like in, in what we read here is, is that is that his thoughts are above our thoughts and his ways are above our ways. As, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so far are his thoughts above our thoughts. And that's measureless. Um, and so, so, so the way he thinks is, is measurelessly above the way we can think. But I don't think that means that, <clears throat> uh, uh, that, that we can't... Um, or learn from the scriptures and, and, and by the spirit that he gives to us to have this mind that Christ has or have the mind that God has. In fact, he wants us to have that. Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 how God has revealed by his spirit things that were hidden for, from, from, for ages past and things, thing, deep things of God he reveals through his spirit. And so I think it's good for us and important, in fact, I think it's vital for us to, to try 
to see things the way God sees them uh, as best as we can from, from our un understanding of Scripture and, and, and the spirit that he uh, gives to reveal those kind of things. Um, and and as, we, as we do that, we learn things about God's nature, about his characteristics, about attributes of God that help us make make more sense out of life, about how to make more sense out of our life and the life around us and the things we see. Um, and, so, and so to do that, to learn those things, we, we kind of have to dig into theological minds, you might say, and, and try to uncover uh, things about God. Now, is, is that good or bad? Um, is it is it a good or a bad thing to deep into to to dig deep into the th I'll call it theological minds about about the characteristics and the nature of God? I think it depends why. Uh, I think it depends why someone digs in there. Um, the scripture has both warnings about it, and it also encourages it. So, without going to all those scriptures that would be warnings and encouraging about it. Think of somebody like the prophet Daniel. Like he, he, he dug deep into the mysteries of God. Um, and he was also given an exceptional spirit of understanding. Like he understood mysteries. Um, and and, and, uh, um, and, and was, given, was given that spirit, or then he was given that spirit and therefore dug into these mysteries. That's, that's, I'm not here to say which one. Uh, but the, the thing that we notice about Daniel, and here's the important thing, is it, it moved Daniel to a, to a very high reverence of God. It moved him to have a great fear of God. It moved him to, to like be, be very, um, uh, very holy, live a holy life. Uh, it moved him to, to faithfulness and obedience. But many people get lost in these minds and digging through the mysteries of God, they uh, for for no good purpose, and 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 uh, they get lost in the mazes of tunnels, and with their heads puffed up full of knowledge, they just keep groping around in darkness, and it doesn't work in them what it did in Daniel, and what it should work in us. Um, and I think that's why I think the reason for that is because people look for the wrong reasons. There's a there's a story, <clears throat> I think it's in. I think it's in 1 Samuel, early in 1 Samuel somewhere, where um, it's, it's that time when the Ark of the Covenant was taken. The Philistines captured it. The Philistines fought against Israel, took the Ark of the Covenant, and, and, and left with it. Well, that's devastating. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, this is, the, this is like the place or the thing that, that, we, that, that Israel had, that God was with them. Um, and now the Philistines had it. And, and the result was that Eli died, Hophni and Phinehas died, uh, one of their wives went into labor, she died. It was, it was, it was devastating, and it was gone for a while. You, you probably know the story. Anyway, bad things happened to the Philistines. They tried to figure out what to do with this thing that they now have on their hands that seems to be causing bad things. Well, finally, some of the, Phil some of the men of the Philistines said, we don't know if these bad things are just circumstance, or if it really is God punishing us or doing something evil. So they said, well, we'll test it. And they took, they said, let's take two milk cows that have calves, that have baby calves on them. And we'll hitch them. They've never been hitched to a, to a cart before. And we'll hitch them to a cart. And we'll put the Ark of it on the cart, the, the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. And we'll send these, these milk cows away. If they go for the land of Israel, we know this is God's doing. He doesn't want this Ark with us. Because everything would be, that would be totally unnatural. First of all, milk cows are not used to carrying carts. They would not leave their babies. This, this, if, if that's what happens, it's God's doing. If it doesn't happen, then all these things that have happened were just, just happened. Circumstances that, um, uh, coincidences, you might say. Well, anyway, that's what happened is they hitched these milk cows to the cart and the cows just... <laughs> They just left. They just started running for Israel. 
And just lowing as they went, like one straight beeline, they ran, ran for the, one of the tribes of Israel. There was no question whether, whether, uh, whether God was moving them to do that. But here's the point I wanted to make is, so the men of Beth Shemesh, I think it was, were out and they were working in their wheat fields and they were harvesting wheat. And they looked and here comes these cows. They're running and carrying the ark. And <laughs> sorry, I don't know why, I don't know why this is <clears throat> affecting me so much. But I mean, here, here in the middle of the day, all, all of a sudden these car, uh, cows come carrying this cart they just stop their work. They rejoice at the returning of the Ark of, Co- of the Covenant. And they gather around. And, and I think they even like, maybe killed the, killed the cows and made a sacrifice and cut the cart up for, for, for wood, for the fire. But here's something that happened. In the middle of all that, <clears throat> in the middle of all that goodness, you might say, uh, a bunch of people opened the Ark and looked into it. And God was so displeased. He was so displeased that he slayed. It seems like there might be a little bit of translation difficulty, but most of the translations say uh, 50,070 men. He killed them. He was so displeased that they looked into this Ark of the Covenant. And I think think the reason is, is that they were looking into these things of God without reverence, out of curiosity, for no good purpose to themselves. This is at a time where there should have been, there should have been repentance. There should have been, uh, there should have been uh, a remorse for why they had lost it, rejoicing for why it came back. There should have been, um, there should have been a very, very holy reverence, a moving of of of, of the people to the fear of God, and in, instead. It doesn't say much. The context doesn't say much. But instead, I think there was just this, a lightness about it in which, in which they were all just curious, like, oh, here's this ark. Um, we have it back. What's it like? And, and God was not. God was very, very displeased about that. <clears throat> so that's what I think can happen if we, if we look into theology. It can be really powerful. Um, but if we, if we don't look into it for the right reason... Uh, it helps us nothing. In fact, it stands against us. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want that to equal. Then, well, let's just not dig into the mysteries of God. Let's not. Let's not want that nature of to, to learn about the nature of God and and the attributes of God and the things of God because over our overall view of of how great the salvation of God is can be can be much better. Um, uh, we can we can learn what it means to him, what this great salvation means to God, what it means to us, who our uh, who our who our fellow 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 brothers and sisters are, and who the ad, uh, the the uh, uh, elite, who, who's in allegiance with the adversary, and all those kind of things. We learn as as we learn. The more we learn how God thinks. Okay, um, and and theology, by the way, is is just the study of God and God's relation to the world. Theology produces something. It results that theology um, affects how we think, and how we think uh, ends up becoming what we do and who we are. And so it does... I mean, there's... I want to I say this maybe as a disclaimer. I, I think there's people who, who do the right things in spite of maybe some bad theology, but, but at, as a general statement, I, I, I think... I think the right theology helps produce the right conduct and the right person. So here's, here's a little bit of this, this inspiration that I had, <clears throat> is how does God see humanity? We already talked a little bit about trees. And I, I, think, I think I had this idea, I had this, yeah, this inspiration about that God sees humanity as one as one great big complex tree. Uh, a tree in which all humans are born, who are born of flesh and blood, are, are in this tree and, and connected, connected together. Um, so remember, like, God exists outside of time. He, he was, he, he's eternal. That means he has no beginning, he has no end. Before the scripture ever says, in the beginning, 
God created, before that, God, st- God existed. It wasn't in the beginning God came into existence, but in the beginning God created something. At the beginning of time, God did something. Before that, God still existed. Um, so he's eternal, and, and so he, he exists outside of time. Now that's a, that too is a, a, a theological idea. Let's pause a little bit and decide whether, does that have any implications? Is that just a bit of knowledge? Is it just interesting? Is it just, you know it, but has no implications? I think it does have some implications. Um, we have a hard time comprehending that, but, but we, we so much exist in time that we have this moment right now, um, and, and the moment before this is gone, it's history, and the moment ahead of us is, is the future. And so we live in this, we live in this um, time, or this, this, this way in which there's a past, and there's a present, and there's a future. God doesn't necessarily live in that. He doesn't necessarily have a past or a future. He, he just is. And, and one of the things that if you follow that, if you follow that idea through, um, God doesn't necessarily foresee what you'll do tomorrow and remember what you did in the past. He just sees you do it because it's who you are and he sees it all in front of him. He doesn't necessarily remember what you did five years ago or foresee what you're going to do in five years as just he sees that as who you are. He sees you doing it. Well, what does that mean? What, that, that implies, at least, that, um, that, uh, that the things that we have done in our past need to be made right, right? Right? We, we if, if God sees us for who we are and he sees things in that way, then, then, uh, then um, it, it doesn't, it's not a matter of, of we go through this life called time and whatever we happen to be doing, whether good or bad, in the last few minutes of our life before we die is who God sees us as. No, he sees us for who we are. And these things in the past either need to, if they're sins, they need to be atoned for, they need to be forgiven, they need to be made right. If we can make restitution, we need to make restitution for them and all those things. <clears throat> um, so, so anyway, that would be like a kind of, uh, just an example of like a theological idea that if we, if we, if we think it through, I think it has practical uh, implications for us. Okay, so, so back to this tree. To us, we all look separate. I'm here, you're there, our neighbor's in his house, everybody's all just separate. Um, and, of course, to a certain extent, we are. Uh, but um, that's based on the fact that we exist in this time, right? Uh, we, we exist in this... And this thing called time that God doesn't necessarily exist in, or for sure is not bound by. And, uh, uh, and, and we, see, we see humanity as, as just these separate things. But perhaps, perhaps he sees it more something like this. And I'll try to do a little illustration. should work. No, let me use a green one. <clears throat> so, um, wish this marker was wider, but, um, you know, before, okay, so I, I didn't make myself for sure I didn't make myself. And, and in a way, there's a way in which God made me, but he didn't just make me out of dust or create me in that way. He, he, uh, I, I, he, he used my father and my mother to make me. Before I existed, I existed in my mother. And before that, I existed in my father. And before my father existed, he existed in my grandmother. And before my grandmother existed, he, uh, he existed in my grandfather. And so it goes back. And so we can... Um, as, as I'm sure a family tree is not a, uh, not a new idea for you, but, you know, all these, um, 
all these branches branch out, but they're all connected, you know? They all, if we, if we, um, if we trace them all back far enough, they're all connected to Adam. By the, you might say, by the fibers of, of flesh. Uh, I could do better if this marker was wider, but you get the idea. And it branches out, it becomes very big, it becomes very complex, and every human being is a twig on this tree. Um, and, the, and, and the roots, or the, the, the fibers, the connection, the connection in a fleshly sense is all connected in a way that it all goes back here and is connected to where humans were originally made, where Adam was created. Adam was not begotten, right? The Son of God was begotten. That means he's, 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 um, he's of the same nature. He's, he's, he's a part, or he's God. He's of the same nature. Well, Adam wasn't of the same nature. He was, he was made out of the earth. And uh, this tree, we could call humanity. We could call it Adam. But it includes every every human being who's been born of flesh. Um, and it, it has its, because, because of, because, not just, well, because Adam rebelled against God and was driven out of the garden, uh, he took his, you, you could say he took his roots in, in uh, selfishness and was rooted in, in doing things by his own, own will. And, um, and, and the fruit, the fruit of all that is humanity. The fruit of Adam and Eve is humanity. I know we could, we could, we could now start debating all kinds of things like original sin and stuff, but that's way beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today. Um, uh, and, so, and, so, and so this is humanity. It's if, if, if it is what I think it is, God sees humanity like that, and this tree produces bad fruit. It's rooted, it's rooted in selfishness. It's rooted in self-will. Um, uh, and and God, God works with this tree. He works with humanity. And um, he gives it laws. He sends it prophets. And he, even, he gives it lots of good things. He gives it, in fact, he gives it the, the ability to even survive. He gives it um, nourishment. He sends it rain. He sends it snow. He, he waters this earth. Let's it, lets it uh, receive from God in order to live and survive. And he works with it. But all in all, it still just produces bad fruit. Some of these branches produce better fruit than, or, 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 or seem better than others, seem more upright, uh, but, but it's all part of the same tree. And uh, uh, this tree, because of sin, has been sentenced to die. But it wants to live. And in its struggle to live, it, it, it becomes ever more selfish. It does not care where it takes its nutrients, it just wants to live. It's got a sentence hanging over it here that it's going to die, but it wants to live. And it, it struggles for that life. <clears throat> um, So that, that tree is humanity, and like I said, some, some of its branches seem better than others. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but so, um, so, long as, so long as it's a part of that tree, its inclinations are the same, its desires are the same, uh, its destiny is the same. And God's ultimate plan is not necessarily to make that tree better, but to cut us off of that tree 
and to put us and graft us onto another one, or to take us out of that humanity and make in himself a new humanity. <clears throat> a, a humanity that is not connected, all those twigs and all those branches are connected through, through the flesh. The, you could say, the, if we think of the fibers in that tree, they're all connected together and they all reach down to the roots one way or another. And, and that's, that's the, the, the first Adam, that's, that's that humanity. But God wants to create a, a humanity that is not connected by the flesh, but by the spirit. It's not rooted in self-will, but in God's will. And it's not destined to die, but it's destined to live. And it's not striving to live, but striving to die. A humanity that was not created or made, but begotten of the same nature as God. <clears throat> it's a tree of a very different sort. Uh, that's, about, that's about as far as my, as my inspiration had gone that I had earlier this week. And I started wondering if, if the scripture bears this image anywhere, um, if it portrays it anywhere, kind of in the way that I was thinking it. And, as, and as, as I started studying, I, I remembered this parable that Jesus gave that has always seemed a little peculiar to me. I've always like read it and thought, yeah, it's neat, but probably it has deeper meaning than what I think. It's in, I'll read it, I'll read it out of Matthew 13 here. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. And he presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger, and the garden, larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but, but Jesus is actually pulling that from something that Ezekiel had said many, many, many years before, a prophecy that he had given. It's in Ezekiel 17. And it's, I won't read that whole chapter. It, uh, the, the beginning part of that chapter talks about how this great eagle with long wings came and it, it, it plucked a branch off of a cedar in Lebanon and went and planted it um, somewhere else. And then the, as best as I can tell, that first part of the prophecy has to do with Egypt and Babylon and some of those battles. But then, and, and, but then in the end, this is what it says. Verse 22 of Ezekiel 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I shall take the choice branches, the the King James translation says the topmost branch. I kind of like that better. I, I'm not sure why this says choice branches, but I'm going to take the choice branches of the cedar from its top and nip off their heart and plant it on a mountain, on a high mountain. I shall hang it on a lofty mountain of Israel. Yes, I will plant it and will bring forth, it will bring forth shoots, produce fruit, and be a, be a great cedar. And under it, every kind of wild animal will take rest, and every kind of bird will rest in its shade, and its branches will be restored. So all the trees of the field will know that I, the Lord, am he who humbles the high tree, and exalts the humble tree, and dries up the green tree, and makes the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. I'm pretty sure Jesus is pulling from that when, when he talks about this 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 mustard seed, this tiny thing that gets planted and it grows to be a tree and, and, then, and then the birds and the fowls from, from all over the world will come and find refuge in it. They'll be, they'll be um, nourished and, and sheltered in, in that tree. And so, <clears throat> in, uh, in the fullness of time, uh, God himself entered into that tree. He became part of this fleshly thing. He became a son of Adam. Um, and, and he became 
a branch on this tree like you and I and like every other human being. The, the, I think it's a prophet Jeremiah who says something like, uh, thus declares the Lord that, um, that he will send a branch out of the, out of, uh, uh, through David or something like that, and he will become a king. And it's prophecy of Jesus. Um, Jesus, or God, through his son, enters this tree, becomes, becomes a part of humanity, takes upon himself flesh, and becomes a branch. I think that prophecy in Jeremiah, I think I've got it written down here, it says a righteous branch. When I will ri- raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall rule as king. <clears throat> On this tree, there has been one righteous branch, truly righteous branch, who never partook of the selfishness, um, but he became a righteous branch. <clears throat> and that's, that's Jesus. And as I, as I think about that, I, I think that what, uh, see what happened with Jesus is he, is he was cut off of humanity. That tree couldn't bear him. We're going to take off this topmost branch. And like, it, and like that parable in Ezekiel says, uh, that, that, that choice branch was nipped off. Let me use a different color here. And it says it was taken up on a high mountain, a lofty mountain of Israel. And there on the top of that mountain, that little branch was planted. And it grew. And it started producing a new humanity. It says it produced shoots and fruit. And it's a tree of a different sort, and it's planted in a different place. Um, and it, it, I think, I think as that parable said that Jesus used is the 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 fowls of the earth, like the Gentiles, people from all nations, tribes, and tongues, uh, will will find their refuge in that tree. They'll find their they'll find. Uh, uh, nourishment and and refuge and 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 life in that tree. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of a this is kind of a th- theological idea. Uh, to me, it's interesting. But does it have any does it have any meaningful uh, practical implications for us? Or what what should we learn from that that affects us? Is it just something to know? Uh, Or is it something we can, is it something that should make, uh, move us to to something, to do something? I think, I think it does. Um, I think it is in, in a concept like that, that we can make sense out of stuff like, there is none righteous, no, not one, when he talks about human beings. It's out of, it's out of um, concepts like this that we, that we can make sense out of that you must be born again. You must be transformed. Uh, you must be redeemed. You must be taken off of that tree and put into this tree. Somehow this has to happen with every one of us. <clears throat> um, I think without without going into a, a, a great deal of of, of um, explanation, like I think it's how we can how how I can make sense out of things like uh, th- things that he has predestined for humanity. It's this concept that this is humanity, and out of this humanity, 
he has chosen to make a new humanity. <clears throat> and there's a destiny preset for this one, and there's a destiny preset for this one. <clears throat> now, I had said earlier that some, some branches, uh, some, some people are naturally nicer and kinder than others. Some people, uh, somehow it seems like virtues come easier for some people than others, naturally. Um, there's a whole lot of things that can be the cause for that. There's a whole lot of natural things that can be ca the cause for that. If you had nicer parents, and if you had a nicer family environment, and if you had a, the, a certain kind of education, if you had even, even things like physical infirmities or, or um, fitnesses, uh, even the food we eat and the weather we are under can affect how nice or how irritable we might be. Um, and those are, all, those are all natural things. And they're, if, if, if we have been blessed with good things like that, they're, they're gifts. They're gifts from God, and they are good. They are, they, it is good to be nice, and it is good to be kind, and it's bad to be irritable. It's bad to be nasty. Um, but, but those things can all exist in that tree on the left. <clears throat> But if it's all just the result of who we are by nature and who we are by being on that, that tree, well, guess what? The natural things are all going to perish, and with it is going to perish the natural man who is by nature nice most of the time. And if the, the, the things that God gave, the things that God... Um, the gifts that God gave that blessed this tree, life, health, strength, uh, nourishment, um, um, uh, and, and even, the, even the better gifts, a good environment, um, good teachers, um, all those things, they're good, and they're nice, and they're blessings from God, um, but as far as we, as far as we know, uh, we don't know that it cost God anything to give us that. But to transfer some uh, transfer branches from there to here, cost Him crucifixion. <clears throat> and if if uh, so, so let's just think a little bit about like. If, if I'm right, if, if, my, if my inspiration or my um, idea about that being humanity and everybody born, everybody born in a fleshly sense is at some point on that tree, um, there's branches on that tree who grew up in wretched environments. They were just surrounded by all kinds of vulgar language and hatred and... Um, uh, just abuses and, and um, all kinds of evil ideas, and that affected them. Um, <clears throat> it develops, it has the very likely, it's likely to develop in that person, a person filled with every kind of depression and rebellion and superstition, and what it takes to convert and to transfer and to redeem someone, to break somebody off of that branch or that tree and move him into this tree, is crucifixion. It takes, it takes crucifixion. <clears throat> and there's branches on that tree that grew up in godly homes who were taught godly virtues from childhood, who had, who had good parental examples, and that shaped him. It shaped him into a way more upright person. They learned how to control their life in a much easier school than than many of those other branches. And yet, it's still on that tree. And it takes crucifixion to transfer it from that tree to that tree. And we need to beware if that is us. If we have those blessings, if, we've been, if, we, if we have been in that environment that, that gives us all those advantages because from whom much is given, 
much is required. From whom much is given, much is required. <clears throat> the Son of God became man to make us sons of God. He didn't just come to make us a better branch on that same tree, but to produce a, a, a man of a new kind, a new humanity on this tree. Uh, sons who are begotten, they are like they are like the substance that they've been begotten from. Um, and I think, I think that's the whole purpose of Christ. That we might participate in the Christ life, which is in fact eternal life. Uh, it always has been eternal life, and it always will be eternal life. We can enter it. We, we have to enter it. We, we, we do not just want to know about it or hope for it, or, uh, but, but become it. John says, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, one thing I'd like to say, like, <clears throat> if you've ever, if you've ever um, had this conversation with people who believe in, in, uh, in, in eternal security, and once, once you're saved, you're always saved, one of the things that they might say is that, um, is that, that, that the scripture says when we, when we believe in him, when we become his child, we have eternal life. And if it's eternal life, then it'll, then it'll last forever. If you were this thing called a Christian for a few years and then, and, 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 and then fell away, he, I've heard, I heard this guy say, like, I don't know what you had, but it wasn't eternal life because it wasn't eternal. But there's a problem with that. By their own logic, they're, they're, by their own logic, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot because if, if, you, if, if that's the logic you want to use, then it also would stand to reason that, that the life never began in them because eternal life has no beginning or end. It just is eternal life. It always has been eternal life. It always will be eternal life. And we have the opportunity to enter into that life and, and become partakers of it. We have the opportunity to exit it and no longer take part of it. Um, and that and that life is the Christ life. It's the life of Christ. Which um, I don't know if I want to take time for this. I, uh, well, well, sure. Uh, it's another. It's another. Th as I, I was thinking about these theological concepts that that have implications, like they are not just. Um, Okay, I want to say this, like, it's not like we have to, we have to know and understand some of these things in order to do right, but they have, they have implications. And, and I was thinking a little bit about what they call the Trinity or the, the three personhood of God. Um, and, um, and this is what I, I, I this, First of all, like I don't, I don't think these these. I think what what is important is why we 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 dig into these things and then what they produce in us. Um, I uh, uh, I think I think there is something deeper there because I I think first of all I, I think the the scripture bears something out like that that about the Father about the Son about the Spirit and for two thousand years people have been uh, debating all the all the uh, things about that and I I think it, most of it comes from from humans trying to put into human minds and in our in our limited minds how to how to understand those things it's understandable why why, why there's a lot of debate about it but um. Uh, let, let me share a, a thought I had. I, all these analogies and illustrations have their limitations. They break down eventually, but what, what is this? It's a reciprocating saw, right? Or a sawzall? What is, what's that? It's a blade. What? what? Come on here. What's this? It's a battery or a power source, and um, and and we we rightly look at this and call it a battery, and we rightly look at this and we call it a saw. 
we, we look at this, we call it a blade. And yet none of these are really like, none of these mean much. I just cannot accomplish anything with this thing. And I can't accomplish anything with this thing. And I can't accomplish a whole lot with this thing either. But when you put them all together, it's still called a sawzall. And there's, you know, there's a whole lot to be accomplished with it. There's, it's something that functions. It's something that, that works. And I, I, I think there could be, you know, you can think about <laughs> the fact that there's like this one God. Like there's that one sawzall. But there's, 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 um, there's actually, think about this. If God really is love, he's not just, he's not just this one, like love cannot just be a singular thing. There's got to be, there's got to be a love that, that is, that is shared, um, or, or it's not love. If, if I understand that right, I, I think the father loved the son and the son loves the father and, and the spirit is in there somehow. The power, um, um, don't, don't, don't ask me to explain that all so that everybody can understand it, but here's the, here's the thought that I had. Does that have any practical meaning for us? Does that, does that, does that thought or that realization mean, mean anything that should uh, affect, affect my understanding even, or, or even, even more my life? I think it does, because we as human beings are made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, and and in First Thessalonians, uh, in First Thessalonians five, verse twenty-three, it says, "Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, or saved complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." God, according to the Hebrew writer, he wants to save us to the uttermost, totally, body, soul, and spirit. And there's already been a little bit touched on that, but those, like, in, in, in those, if those, if we don't recognize that, if we don't recognize that God wants to save you in your flesh, like your flesh, your body, your doings, your thing, he wants that to be saved, he wants that to become this new humanity. He wants it to produce and act the, the Christ life. Like if that's, as I understand, the Gnostics might have believed, like not possible, not doable, it's all about the spirit. Well, it produces something. It produces Gnosticism, which, or it produces a, uh, a, a, a faith that, that, that does not um, follow the Christ life. Um, or if we think it's not about saving the soul, the spirit, the, the, the deep things of the heart, and it's all just about what we do in the flesh. It's what I do with my hands, and it's what I do with my legs, and, and that's all that matters. There's something seriously missing. We're going to go through life, and we are not going to, uh, we are not, 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 going to be transferred from that tree to this tree. We're not going to have victory in our life. We're not going to have victory in our thought life. We're not going to have the Christ life, the Christ thoughts, the Christ way in us. <clears throat> I think we could go on for a long time uh, talking, like drawing, drawing things out of, out of these these kind of concepts. I want to. I wanted to. I wanted to. Uh, where did I put this ray? I wanted to uh, illustrate one more thing. You know how in John 14, or is it 15? John 14 or 15, where he talks about the vine and the branches, and how he how he prunes uh, those those branches who have been taken off of this tree and grafted into this tree. It's those branches that he's talking about where he then says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he that bears fruit in me um, uh, abides in here, and, 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 and the one that abides there, that he will prune it so that it will bear more fruit. And I think, this is one of the <laughs> things I thought would be neat, I think as he prunes this tree, in every one of us it will look more and more <laughs> like that. 
And that's what that tree looks like. And when he says he's going to, and when he says there in Ezekiel that he's going to exalt the humble tree, that is a really humble tree. That is actually from this perspective, from this point of view, this looks like nothing short of death. It's a very humble thing to be, to be brought onto this tree. And yet, like it says in Ezekiel, he's going he's gonna to exalt the humble tree and he's going to humble the high tree. And eventually, and it's happening all the time because time goes on. Uh, it hasn't happened to this huge thing called humanity yet, but it's happened to, to, to those of us who exist in time. The sentence that is upon this tree will happen, and the tree will die. We're not asked to become something that we're not. We're not asked to become uh, the Christ life while living on this tree. We're actually asked to become something that we are. We're supposed to become a part of this. We ourselves will take the need to need to suffer the pain and the and 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 the and the and the uh, uh, the cross that it takes to be cut off of this tree and die on that one. <clears throat> we're, we're called to become partakers of that. We we can be made sons of God, and just like the Father said about the Son of God, in Him I am well pleased. We are, he with us are working together to come to a place where he can say of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me just close by reading a few verses in Ephesians and then we'll open it up for comments. In Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to the, his kind intentions, which he purposed in him. With a view to administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth, in him. May the Lord add his blessing and uh, feel free to either expand or correct on things that were shared. God bless. Or ask questions. Thank you, Brother Dwayne. Um, yeah, that was that was uh, excellent. That was, uh, that was really good. I praise the Lord for that. Um, I think, yeah, one of the significant things that you said that jumped out at me that was really nice is, uh, so the tree on the left um, is the tree that is of the flesh that stems from Adam, the base, the, the, the root, the uh, trunk of the tree. And then saying how, one good thought there was is how all of those branches, um, many times, and, and, I, and, I, and the thought that, that I think of, I, I know I quote this verse a lot, but I think it's so significant, is Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, um, or I paraphrase it, um, just how that thought in there talks about how, you know, the devil kept them enslaved by their fear of death. Um, and because of the fear of death, because like you said, way over here, they're striving to live, that they're actually, you know, fighting each other, each branches are fighting each other, uh, taken from each other, all the various things that go on in order for that struggle uh, to live as they hurt one another and, and, and whatever, the branches tend to do that. Um, and I forget exactly, you know, over in the other tree, obviously, is, uh, you know, I don't think you actually said this, but kind of the way I see it is, uh, obviously, the tree on the left is the first atom, the tree on the right is the second atom. The tree on the second atom is spirit. The tree on the sec on the first uh, or the first atom, the tree on the left is uh, is of the flesh. It comes from 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 Adam. 
And um, anyway, that was just really good. I had to get so many thoughts jumbled here. Um, I guess the one one thought that I have when you were talking about the scriptures uh, um, was Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, there's there's a bunch of different ones, like you said, Jeremiah, that refer to messianic prophecies about uh, the son of David, the son of God that would come. Uh, so Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, from the root of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by, um, oh. he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall uh, judge, or discern uh, the poor, decide with equity, for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. And it goes on from there, but yeah, I was just thinking of that one, referring to him as a branch. And and it's interesting, I don't think you mentioned it, but between those two trees of our nature, the, the fleshly nature and then the one on the right of the, of the spiritual nature that comes through Christ, um, that you have the original tree where, the, you know, the, the the trunk of the tree on the left, it was commanded, do not eat from this tree. And that it's a tree that led to transgression, and uh, and then there was the tree that you know Christ, the second Adam, died on, to to provide this second uh, spiritual tree that we can be engrafted to. Anyway, I, I just yeah, bunch of thoughts there. Um, I see there was another thought I wanted to share. Uh, I, I guess one thought. Um, I don't know how far. I guess it won't take this very far, but. Um, but yeah, when we think about, you know, this, this Trinity idea, Father, Son, and Spirit, um, Jesus himself said, he didn't say God has a spirit. He said God is spirit. There's a big difference between having something, the have verb, <laughs> versus the is verb. <laughs> you know, God is spirit, right? And so the very nature of God is spirit, just like the very nature of us is humanity, is biology, it's, it's, it's flesh. Um, so so um, uh, yeah, I, I guess one, one thought I was going to say that the tree on the right, the, the, tries, the second Adam tree, um, with it being spiritual, um, I just think of that passage in Romans chapter 8, where it says, and I know I've quoted that a lot of times, or re referred to it, where it says that um, that if any of you don't have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. Or see, how does it say it? It it correlates Spirit of God together with the Spirit of Christ. Um, kind of, in in my interpretation, like put an equal sign between the two of them. Um, but that I would see that as the tree on the right. Um, yeah, I guess starting in verse nine. Uh, so Romans chapter 8 verse 9, but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Uh, so yeah, just correlating the spirit of God with the spirit of Christ. So so to me, I don't, yeah, I don't think you said it, but the tree on the right, I see that tree is spiritual. It's Christ um, as opposed to the tree on the left is flesh. Uh, anyway, I guess that was the extent of my thoughts. So. Also, thank you, Brother Dwayne. Uh, just a few thoughts, but um, I mentioned this to, well, I mentioned it to Joseph and Winnow yesterday. I said, um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, uh, well, is it 14, wait, where it says, someone says to Paul, well, what does a spiritual body look like? And I think that's a great question. I think, I, if I was, I would have, hey, Paul, 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 what, what is, and the first response he gives, you fool, you fool, you know, uh, uh, it's the dumbest question you can ask. What is a spiritual body? And I thought it was the smartest question you can ask to show you how foolish I am. You know, when he says, the, the person Paul says, you know, what is a spiritual? Well, and, you know, it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and, and, and you know, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground, combining that. But anyway, 
a, a verse that I memorized, and an 80-year-old man told me this. It wasn't you, Dijon. He told me this when I was like 50. It was Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the works of the law, that we may do all the things of the law. Deuteronomy. That goes before Isaiah 55, where you read this morning in uh, your thoughts, not my thoughts, and my noise. And Brother Teo, a couple of years ago, he, he brought that point out. I think Teo will remember. He said the context to that was probably mercy. It was mercy. The verse before that says, how I will pardon you. So his thoughts are not our thoughts. But mercy goes. As God himself said, the Lord, Lord, merciful, gracious, long-suffering when he appeared to Moses on the thing. And so mercy is the thing. I don't know if you still remember that tale, but I, I buy it too, that it's mercy. But anyway, just uh, one other thought that uh, David was a man after God's own heart, and the apostles give us the mind of Christ or try to tell us how to have the mind of Christ, which is unsearchable, but we should be as you said, the cross, conformed to his image. But notice... Uh, and uh, you mentioned when they took the Ark of the Covenant and they were bringing it and they were fearful. And uh, the commentators will say in Psalm 24, they say when, um, I'll just read a couple of verses in that. Uh, Lift up your heads, O your gates, and, be you and ye be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O your gates, even lift them up, Ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. So that's when they brought the Ark and the Covenant back into the city of Jerusalem after they beat the Philistines. Oh, in fact, what they did was, you, you know the story, Ben and I, after David, they moved it a couple of steps from Edom Obam, and he sacrificed to God, rejoicing. Instead of being filled, he rejoiced. Mm -hmm. Then he moved a few more steps, and he rejoiced and offered more sacrifice. And so when he came into Jerusalem, he started dancing. It was holy dancing, right? And that's when Michael despised him, and he was so thrilled with that, like that. And that's the rejoicing, that the, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And so that's, uh, that's the attitude we should have uh, for that. It's... Um, uh, it should, in, in one thought would be similar, and that should go with, with Brother Dito's lesson last week. You know, Gideon, well, let me put the fleece out for a little bit, and then that, then don't. so Gideon did five fleece tests, right? Five tests, just to see if God is really on my side. And so we do those things, I guess we all. Gideon, that was a good lesson Dito gave on Gideon, to see, Lord, just show me a token. Show me a token. And so David had to do it, he took steps, and, and, uh, uh, God didn't strike it down like, you know, they did it the right way, right? They did it on poles and the Levites carried the ark. They did it according to the will of God, not to the will, will of man like Nadab and Abihu. The Lord be magnified. I guess one last thought since uh, Brother Robert brought it up. Yeah, going back to the ark at a covenant thing. Yeah, my thought is, uh, I'd love to hear what other people think is the reason why God, um, both with the situation where they were carrying the ark and the one man stumbled and he went and grabbed the ark, he wasn't of the tribe of Levi, I think that's why he was struck down because the ark, because the, um, I th I'm, my understanding is that the law of Moses is actually saying that it's Levitical priests that have authorization to, um, you know, work with the ark of the covenant and possibly here with those 55,000, I think it was, that were struck, that maybe it was because you know, only Levitical priests were authorized to open the covenant, but or, or the Ark of the Covenant. I got an idea that might not be necessarily orthodox. As Brother Duane was drawing the picture of the two trees, if I was called to choose a tree that would represent my family tree, my ancestors, my nation, if you like. I don't even know what that is. But I would have to choose the bramble bush, and that would present uh, all the glory and wonderful things that my ancestors were proud of. And uh, I think that would fit with most of what uh, Brother Duane was presenting to us today, 
by the way, I'm, I'm really grateful and I think it's wonderful um, that uh, that tree would have to die. I was, uh, well, I, I didn't mean to take too much time, but I don't have a opportunity, an opportunity to come to the a meeting when the stories are presented to the children. So I'll try to say it in a few words. Uh, when I was five, six years old, I just could not compel my older brother that was already 12, 13 years old to read something from those books that he was reading. I want to know what's in the books. But he, of course, would not dare to read that loud because my mom was very quick to reward him with uh, something tangible <laughs> because we were not allowed to read those books <laughs> by our parents, especially my mom. And uh, so when I was seven years old, and I finished the first grade of the public schooling. I walked uh, from the public library, that was a small library, uh, to our home. And I passed by a huge library that was called, in their language, Matica Srpska, which means uh, National Metropola, whatever that means. But Anyway, it was a huge building made of, built of uh, uh, um, white marble and so on. How that survived uh, social or communist revolution, I don't know, God only knows. But I noticed the people that are going in were all the people of higher education, lawyers, professors, engineers, and so on. And I wanted to know what there is. So I managed to open that door that was huge, big door, and get in. And uh, I come to the reception desk or librarian desk. It was a huge desk. It was almost to my nose, you know. And I stand behind that or in front of that desk and the lady that was librarian leaned forward and said, and what do you want, little boy? And uh, I say, I want to become a member of this library. <laughs> and she was surprised, apparently. She looked and said, oh. And then after a couple of seconds, she said, yes, you can become a member of this library. And she asked me to fill in the card and write my name and address and so on. We didn't have a telephone. That was a strange thing, uh, especially for some believers. <laughs> and so she gave me a membership card. And she took me through the library and showed to me this is this kind of books and that kind of books and that. Uh, and then she said, and back there are some books that hardly anyone reads, so I won't take time to show you that. And guess what? I wanted to see what is there. <laughs> that part of the library was not mopped, was not cleaned. A thick layer of dust was covering the books. And there was one big shelf and uh, the sign, a little plate, and uh, what I read on that sign was a religion. I said, oh, so there is something left of the religion in communism, in socialism. And so I went there, and there I found something that I did not find anywhere else. And one of the things that 
that is still in my mind is a small book and the title of the book was Victory Over Satan. I, I did not know much about victory at that time, um, but I took that book and I borrowed the book. I took it to the desk. The lady gave me the book and uh, I went out of the library and I sat under a window of that library. It was just about one foot tall, big step, and then the window was huge. So I sat down there, it was a sunny day, and I read that booklet, it was a small book. I'm sorry. <laughs> I read the book, and I wanted to see if there are more books of the same writer. I took the book back to return it, and uh, that lady librarian said, oh, you didn't like it? You can leave it here and choose another one. And say, I did. I just read through. And I'm afraid she didn't believe me. And <laughs> I went and chose, I, I chose another book, but I won't talk about that at this time. Uh, why did I tell you that? Victory over Satan was, according to that poem, not by the power of Assyrian or Babylonian army, none of their kings and so on. This king from heaven was and has been ever since victorious by suffering and suffering and suffering patiently, and his suffering is much more powerful than all the fury of the enemy. It was a, I cannot tell you how beautiful a poem, and I don't know why we, the believers, didn't have anything from that writer, and I don't know who he was, and so on. Well, thank you for listening. I probably didn't tell you why I told you all this story, but Hopefully someday if I live long enough, if not, Lord willing, see you up there. Thank you very much, and thank you, the brothers that uh, gave the comments, but especially the presentation of uh, um, Duane. I wouldn't dare, I would not dare to present that as you did. I think it's, it's really... Is it right to say explosive? It just, like in the beginning when the Lord was creating the world and he said, light, and there was light. I, I imagine that, not like in the ordinary English, which I still, I'm still learning, uh, let there be light. But he just said light and there was light. Um, Creation is amazing, but salvation is much more amazing. And uh, thank you for telling that the price was crucifixion. I have, I wish somebody would present or, or talk or preach about that more. How that Lamb of God was slain since the foundation of the world how much the Lord is suffering. And he is still suffering because he said, I'm with you all the way to the end of the world. Uh, <laughs> whenever I do something wrong, he's suffering. Thank you. You did say it was okay to add to a little bit, Dwayne? Um, I just thought, uh, first of all, the allegory, the illustration was good, but to leave this tree without fruit just 
just seems to be not quite the whole message. You know, we come here, it's the cross, we come here to die, just like Brother Dwayne pointed out. And, uh, and we do that to bring forth fruit. Where the branch is pruned, where it's trimmed back, it's meant to bear fruit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not meaning to mess up your illustration, just, just to add, add to it. Another thought that came to my mind, um, and that was a. Am I doing something wrong? Um, it was a beautiful allegory of of the first Adam and the second Adam. Um, the need the need to do that, to be born again, to be transformed into the kingdom. Of God, but one thing that stood out to me is this tree and that tree are still pretty close together. They're on the same board. Um, this one is elevated, um, and uh, and uh, so it just it, it just came into my mind. How does that play itself out in our daily life? Um, we understand. It to be a process, to be a cycle, knowing that there is a time in every Christian's life where they have to make the conscious choice that I'm no longer going to be a branch on this tree, I am going to be transplanted. Yet, there are some things, we're still in this tree's environment. We are, we are uh, and, until the Lord creates a new heaven and a new earth, a lot of the things that we dealt with at this tree are still a part of our life here. Who our parents were didn't change. Um, a lot of us have made changes to our environment probably that, that give us advantages and that's all right and good. Um, you know, our coworkers may still be vulgar. Uh, we live in a, we still live in a world that is doomed. Uh, the world as we know it is doomed. And so, as we, as we consider that, as we live out this reality in our lives, I was just, uh, I was just drawn to the words of, of uh, I'll go back to my seat, hopefully it'll work. I was drawn to the words of Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Um, and I just thought that fit well with the, with the lesson that Brother Dwayne shared. Um, the, the tree on the left will always produce humanity and more humanity and more humanity until the Lord returns. Has, everyone, uh, uh, has anyone ever had a, a baby that was born spiritual? <laughs> the, it, it, it doesn't tend to be that way. And so that tree will will always always be there in its production. Um, I especially appreciated where where Dwayne pointed out that there can even be there can even be uh, good attributes on that tree, uh, godly learning, godly manners, and, and things like that. Yet they are things born of of human nature, whereas the uh, the tree on the other side, though it though we I did appreciate the comments that said that is that is an allegory of something spiritual, um, and and uh, we have been transformed to that tree, transplanted, grafted into that tree, so that we might bear forth much fruit, in spite of the fact that we have not completely been removed from our uh, circumstances, not our original circumstances. And so may God give us that power in, in our day to live that out.
Yeah, I just want to say uh, amen to the thoughts he shared and thank you for sharing them. Um, and also I uh, want to say thank you for uh, reading uh, the scripture reading in the opening. Um, I, I had a I had one thought um, that I thought I'd share that about uh, faith and works um, that was brought up after the opening. Um, just Brother Robert shared how every, you know everyone I know that says I know thy works uh, to every one of them, and uh, so um, let's see. What I wanted to read here was I lost it. Okay, it's in Revelation three. Uh, hmm. No, I guess maybe it was in two, and that's why I'm not finding. Yeah. Um, to the church in Thyatira, he said, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. I kind of tend to think that, like, when he says, I know thy works, like, in the beginning to everyone, to each church, he's just, he's not saying something that's distinctive of, like, making a distinction between faith and works. Um, but he's just saying, I know, I know, I know your workings. I know all the things you do. Like I would think that charity, um, in the way we think about works, like that would be a work, and service would be a work, and faith, I think, is a work, um, and patience um, is a work. Those are all works, I think, and I think they're good, good works. Um, I, tend, I tend to think when uh, James said that faith without works is dead um, just saying there's this thing that somebody can do it, it, by saying just saying they have faith in something but if there's no if there's no evidence or fruit um, come come from that profession of faith um, it's it's dead and it's meaningless. I was thinking about like that tree. Like why why would you uh, why would you allow yourself to be cut off of that tree to be grafted into the other tree? It would be if you have faith. If you know that this tree over here is going to be destroyed, um, and you have faith in uh, in Christ and in the tree. Uh, on the hill there, you would want to be want to be grafted in there. But if you were just to remain on that tree and say you have faith in in the other tree, like there's no there's no profit in that. No, that doesn't help you. Anyway, I just I, I and and just the thought about how we as humanity about how God would see humanity as like as a thing. Um, <laughs> It, as as one entity in in one way, I think I think there's there's a there's a there's a way in which he sees us all individually, and then a way in which he would see us all connected like that. That just kind of bore witness with uh, thoughts that I was having myself the last week. So I just appreciate it. Yeah, I guess one last uh, couple of thoughts. Um, yeah, Brother Norman, I was going to say if. Uh, if faith is a work, then why would James say faith without works is dead? Because if faith is a work, then it's impossible to separate them, right? Can't have faith without works if, worth, if faith is a work, right? Anyway, <laughs> just a little thought there, brother. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, um, I thought was relevant to the two trees up there. Um, this is what Paul says. Um, I, I know we probably all know this verse, but I'll just mention it. So 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life be or living being. 
um, the last Adam, or the second Adam, became a life-giving spirit. So yeah, it's like we're referring to those two trees, living being or, you know, being of the flesh, I guess I think is the implication there. The first Adam and the tree on the left, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So, okay, that was, that was it. It's, uh, it's getting long here, so I'll, I'll make this real quick. But I, um, there, there's something really interesting about the nature of trees, and when a tree is planted, when it begins, there is something about its nature that makes it grow up and stretch toward light. It's how we develop the part of the tree that we see above the ground, and yet there's also a part of the tree um, that that uh, responds to darkness and grows down. And I think it's a right statement to say that the root systems of trees below are often as big as uh, the upper part of the tree. Anyway, um, if, if the tree on the left to the tree that, that we're all a part of, that we all start in, we, we look for sustenance, we look for growth. You talked about nutrients drain Dwayne, um, and it all comes from, from worldly things. And yet when we're transferred into the tree of life, Paul says that we're rooted and grounded in Christ and that our sustenance, what sustains us, what develops that cross that you see is Christ himself. That's where we draw our strength from. And it's, it's part of a system that is just as big that the world may not see until we explain it to them and tell them about it that that's where we draw our strength from, that it comes from Christ. And it's, it's where we're drawing what allows us to be up there and be crucified with Christ. Thank you, brother. I'll make it quick for time's sake. I'm going to be a peacemaker between Brother Norman and Brother um, Brett on um, the devils believe and tremble. That's the work. And this is the work uh, in John 6, 27. It says, show us the work. And he said, well, this is the work that you may believe. So there are bad works, evil works, the devil and things. And the good works are the works of righteousness, works of obedience and faith. So both of the two brothers are right. The Lord be magnified. I'm afraid Brother Max is right. We, we should make an end of this, especially those of us that talk so long. Um, I, I'm sitting here right behind Brother Norman. I think I did understand a little bit better than Brent, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, those that were on the right hand side on the day of separation of good and evil doing when the lord jesus addressed them and said come o ye blessed and you did this and that and that and that they had all the works recognized by the one that was working in them but their response was, when did we ever do something so wonderful and something so good? I'm paraphrasing because uh, my English is not very good. But, uh, uh, and those that were on the left-hand side, their attitude and their question is, when did we ever miss to do something good? They were very good. And so in that light, I would say that Lazarus the beggar, for whom May I say the angels were waiting to see the end of his, the suffering of Lazarus. The angels are waiting to take him to the glory. He, not being able to do anything, he had all the works that the Lord Jesus Christ was working in him. And that's the work that really works. The other thing, uh, it takes a little bit more courage, and I'm, what American people say, a chicken. Um, what is that? Is that the end of uh, the first epistle of John that says, children, beware of idolatry? I'm not quite sure, but I wanted to submit to your consideration there is work without faith and that is idolatry and it may be apparently good work you know mercy 
kindness and uh, collection for this and collection for that and so on, going all the way to the other uh, end of the world to do something good, although in my backyard there is a need much greater and so on. But work without faith is, I believe, or I perceive also idolatry. So what is the true faith in the Lord when he works in us? Whether the other people see that or no, recognize, that's a different question. But that's the Lord that we have when we trust and obey him. He works in us and he works and he works and he never gives up. In the end, he rewards all that he has done in us and that crown and that uh, reward and so on I don't deserve anything it's all his that's why we need eternity to praise and adore him who is the Lord of all thank you and thank you brother Max you're right I, I hope I won't say anything else today God bless you I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I am.